Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and uh, I'm trying. Uh, I'm doing the uh, the layover in the uh, uh, in the airport thing, um, but uh, the problem is they keep having copyrighted songs on the intercom. A lot of Mariah Carey uh, oh, Christmas songs. Uh, I just finished watching um, episode seven of Watchmen, um, and I gotta say I had a very strong negative reaction to the last one, which to me was just uh, uh, I don't know. Damon Lindelof trying to qualify for reparations. Apparently I didn't realize how much slavery and uh, um, 1921 uh, massacres affected, uh, uh, apparently Damon Lindelof was most affected. Had a lot of emotional uh, swings on this uh, series. Loving some episodes, uh, hating some others. I think, yeah, I think the, I tend to swing back and forth from one episode to the other. This one was more of a solid I kept thinking about this, um, I think it did two seasons, or it was like two seasons in a movie, this, uh, do you remember Sensate by the Wachowski siblings um, from a couple years ago? It actually kind of reminded me about that. It was like a weird ensemble sci-fi show. So this one was pretty solid. And surprisingly, at the end, in the credits, Damon Lindelof was not credited as, as being one of the writers. Although in TV, the person listed is on the script is all that means is they did the final script like the scene descriptions and the final dialogue um, usually in TV production the episode is created by a lot of different people in a writer's room then it's assigned out to two people to finish and, and then on something like this which is supposed to be only one season and planned as one season you know obviously it's probably very very tightly based on Damon Lindelof's outline that being said I just liked it. A lot of things happen in this uh, episode, a lot of things. Um, and people act kind of more normal. They have more normal human emotions. I, that being said, I, I started to make myself laugh, um, uh, asking myself a rhetorical question of, uh, if you told uh, Damon Lindelof that black people can you know, uh, feel joy, how confused would he be? <laughs> I just imagine that um, uh, Damon Lindelof imagines uh, the life of a black person is just like uh, being endlessly uh, handed a uh, ice cream cone and then the uh, ice cream scoop falling on the ground forever, <laughs> infinitely. You, you hand a black person infinite uh, ice cream cones and uh, infinitely the uh, um, scoop of ice cream will fall on the ground. Um, so this one, like I said, it's a lot of, not exactly culminations, but I would call them intersections of a bunch of different subplots. Now, I'm a writer, um, and you know, one of the things when you're brainstorming a, a story is you just get a, you know, little glimpses of a scene or a twist or a, a character or a, or a line of dialogue, and you either write them down or you just keep a mental checklist. That's what I do. I don't actually write them down. Um, my idea is, you know, my, my, my theory is that if an idea is a really good idea, I'll remember it. And if it's kind of lame, it'll, you know, fall down the memory hole. But uh, I just realized what was so strange about this uh, Watchmen uh, TV show is it seems to me it's based on the idea of you have your, your brainstorming sessions and then you say, okay, so we're going to do every single idea I had, every stray thought, every, a lot of the, uh, Damon Lindelof going through the original Watchmen graphic novel and just picking little tiny things that are mentioned once or twice, you know, like, uh, Vietnam being the 51st state and just doing a whole big subplot on that. You know, obviously, uh, 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 Dr. Manhattan says, uh, I think I'll create some people of my own. And he does, you know. And uh, so everything kind of comes from somewhere. Originally, they said this was just kind of inspired by Alan Moore's Watchmen and is very much a 100% sequel. Uh, we didn't get a uh, Ozymandias scene last episode, but this time we do. It's another weird uh, uh, scene, this time of a trial. A trial that is in its 365th day. And I've got to say, a court proceeding that goes on for a year or more, I can definitely identify with that. Oh boy, uh, we finally got a, uh, a setting for the first of the pre-trial uh, meetings uh, for January 7th of next year, you know, a month from now. 
And that's just to discuss things happening all through 2020. So people ask, is there movement? And I say, yeah, <laughs> it's glacial, but it is moving. Um, so um, I, I like when they, okay, so now the intercom's doing public domain Christmas songs, that's fine. I can't get a copyright strike from a song that was written 120 years ago. Do more of that. Um, uh, Angela Abar, oh, spoilers, go check it out. Although if you have not seen it until right now, Wait two more weeks and then uh, just binge the whole thing in a long weekend, uh, a 72 or a 96, as we would have said in the military. So uh, what are the revelations we have right now? Um, number one is that Dr. Manhattan is actually Angela's cuck, pussy, beta husband. Um, he's kind of been sticking out as a sore thumb because they cast a guy who looks like a superhero, played a supervillain. Um, and then he's just been a completely useless pussy. I mean, uh, he's literally been pushed out of the way, uh, straight out of frame twice during, uh, you know, action sequences. This, you know, six foot two muscular guy, completely ineffective in almost any situation. What we find out is that he was actually Dr. Manhattan, although he doesn't know it. Um, Dr. Manhattan decided he wanted to, re uh, to live a regular life, so he, uh, created a device that made him forget that he was Dr. Manhattan and not have access to his powers. And this one, Angela basically says, okay, hey, we know we need to smashes the skull in and pulls out the device. And uh, presumably he's going to be back to being uh, Dr. Manhattan. That being said, going back to my thing about Damon Lindelof being just not even shocked, just more confused if you told him black people can experience joy. Um, so much tragedy. We get to see Angela Abar's grandma who is also the baby sister of her grandpa well kind of like a adopted symbolic baby sister whatever um, who goes and finds her in a, uh, a orphanage in Vietnam and then uh, like I said it, this uh, the way that this whole story goes it's so over top then that when something tragic happens I actually laughed out loud when this uh, woman who's about, who, who in the storyline would be about 70, travels across the world to raise a granddaughter that she uh, uh, never met and barely knew existed and was estranged from you know, her, grand, or her own uh, son, she's like, oh, I had a, a heart attack, just a small one, I laughed. And then later after, um, there's been a lot of scenes of, uh, of adults uh, speaking to children as if the children are adults is just really odd. We got more of that type of scene. Like, you know, all of the Dave, all, all the Damon Lindelof uh, black characters, they all talk like this. Like slavery just ended two and a half minutes ago. Uh, like, <laughs> they, uh, they never talk like just, you know, your average black person or, or I don't, has black. Damon Lindelof's met black people, right? I mean, I'm assuming he was on set at least once. I saw a picture where he was talking to the lead actress, so, I mean, he's, he's met at least one. Um, anyway, you know, my point through almost all these uh, uh, reviews is Damon Lindelof writes black people as uh, if they're space aliens or gods from Mars, um, and he seems very nervous and scared to just write them as people. Um, uh, so yeah, so a lot of the big dramatic points, like at one point uh, 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 an old Mima has a heart attack and dies, you know, um, and I uh, actually laughed because it was like, I've never seen this character just not experience constant misery towards it almost be makes her like a, like a Warner Brothers uh, cartoon character. Um, besides that, um, we got more of Lori Blake, the 70-year-old uh, FBI special agent. Uh, kind of funny, kind of a little bit too on the nose meta bit with the trap door. Um, uh, let's see, what else we got? White people be evil. We got that like three different times. Uh, uh, more lines that are supposed to be dramatic but are just silly. Uh, Lady True, who's kind of the uh, Ozymandias of this story, saying it's uh, talking about um, Dr. Manhattan. Um, uh, the, the evil uh, white, sorry, that was redundant. Um, the evil white senator wants to transform himself into a new Dr. Manhattan. And then Lady True goes, imagine all those powers. 
in the hands of a white supremacist. And I know for some like progressive, you know, coastal elite like Damon Lindelof or, you know, someone like Mark Wade, that line is like really, really deep and foreboding. But to the average person, it's just silly. White supremacists are just like idiots living in shacks who can barely like feed themselves. The idea that they're building scientific contraptions and they're gonna capture and kill and then turn themselves into gods is just stupid. It's just silly and stupid and it, it breaks immersion. And uh, luckily they only kind of do little quick shots of you know a bunch of 7th Cavalry and Rorschach Max uh, assembling some sci-fi contraption. You're like, okay, whatever. Um, uh, apparently there was a good scene that we don't get to see of uh, 7th Cavalry going to uh, Looking Glass's uh, uh, bunker and him uh, capping like five of them. Um, besides that, am I missing anything? Oh, uh, Lady True has, uh, did every single thing in the world by the age of 24, uh, but you can get into one of her locked rooms just by like busting the, the handprint scanner. <laughs> With a solid object. Okay, whatever. That's fine. Um, a hint that uh, Eddie Blake, comedian, we might see him. I'm very interested in that. Um, what else? What else? That was about it. Like I said, a lot of things happened. Um, I know uh, uh, Nerdette said, it, or at least you know from the title of her video, it sounded like this was a very emotional. It, it was more entertaining. It, it kept it kept my attention. It was funny. Not when it was supposed to be, but a lot of things happened. There was just some cool bits, some cool visuals, and it was it was uh, interesting. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe and make sure you're still subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications. Thanks to everyone giving to the GoFundMe and the Indiegogo. Links are in the description, um, and I will have uh, uh, more uh, comic reviews up later today. Thanks. Bye.